Good morning, everybody. Are you ready to hear God's word? Amen. I'm excited that we're in this series called Focus 2020, Be Transformed. Are any of you ever like me and you can struggle staying focused? Anybody in the house? There are times I can struggle with staying focused and, I, and when I do, I go back to one of my favorite Olympic stories. I've told this before, maybe you've heard it before, 2002 Winter Olympics. There were five finalists in the men's 1,000 meter speed skating race. And during the final lap, the American and the Chinese skaters seemed to be out in front with the Canadian and the Korean skaters behind them. Australia trailed behind and everyone just thought that skater was having just such a tough day. Well, suddenly, as they were going into the last turn, the Chinese skater slightly bumped the American skater and sent both of them stumbling and spinning out of control. Well, there was no room to get out of the way because everyone had lost their what? Focus. And all of a sudden, the Canadian and the Korean skaters were tangled up in the mess. But where was the Australian? Because he was in last place, he skated beyond everyone, crossed the finish line, and he goes, I won gold! All because he had stayed focused. Yeah. See, it's hard for all of us to stay focused at times. To keep the main thing the main thing. To keep our eye on the prize that God has before us. That certainly is, can be true of churches too. And that's why we've been working so hard with our mission statement. In fact, it's on the screen. Let's say it together. This is the focus of Bridgewater Church when we talk about be transformed. Let's say it together, ready? Bridgewater Church is called to lead people into a transformational relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's say it again. Bridgewater Church is called to lead people into a transformational relationship with Jesus Christ. Christ. Now, you're sitting here and you're probably thinking, Pastor, aren't all churches supposed to be helping people find a transformational relationship with Jesus? Well, we are. We're all supposed to do that. But sometimes we can lose our focus on what that's about. And then all of a sudden, a church can begin to think that the ministry is for me. It's all about me. It's about what I think and what I want. I'm sure none of you have ever experienced that before. But you see, at Bridgewater, we want to be reminded on a constant basis that our responsibility is to lead people into a transformational relationship with Jesus. We don't want people to just simply believe in God. We want people to have a personal relationship with Jesus. So over these last few weeks, we've been talking about the four key elements that we need to help us stay focused. We've talked about our calling We've talked about our culture here at BWC as it relates to God's word. And today it's time to talk about our talk. How's your talk been this week? Sweet, loving, 24 seven, the entire time. You haven't said one cross word, amen? Why isn't people, why aren't people agreeing? I don't understand. See, the power of our words, have you thought about it? The power of the words that we have and that we share with other people. It's one of my favorite moments in life. I was golfing with my father-in-law when he was alive, Bob Yoder, he turned 70 years old. I looked at Bob and I said, Bob, this was on like hole two of 18. I said, Bob, you're turning 70. I'm being a wonderful son-in-law. I'm taking you out for a game of golf and paying for it. So I said, how about a word of wisdom? Now, Bob was a man of few words, and he didn't say anything. He didn't answer it. I thought maybe you're 70. You didn't hear it. I don't know. Do you know when he finally answered me? Hole 18. Three hours later, Bob answers my question. He said, now about that question, I had to be reminded myself of what I asked. 
He said, here's my word of wisdom for you. Bob said, whatever you're going to say to others, say the words to yourself first and decide if the words in your mind should be words that come out of your mouth. Wow. Have any of you ever said anything that once it got out of your mouth, you wished you'd have never thought it, let alone said it? See, when we talk about the power of words, words have power. They create pictures. They have meaning. Paul wants us to understand how to talk the talk that helps us stay focused in our lives and in the life of our church. He wants us to get the talk right so we don't get distracted. So he looks again at this young Timothy that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, and he looks at Timothy, and he, he's writing him a letter. And in this letter, he writes two what we would call verses now that I think have some of the highest impact for this young pastor named Timothy. I want to give you three instructions to talk the talk in a way that pleases God and gives just spiritual power to the words that God wants us to say. Look, look at chapter 2, verse 1. You then, my son, Paul writes to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now here's the first instruction. Let's say it together. Talk the talk and lead the revolution. Now I want, to, I want you to get this in your minds. Whatever you're saying, whatever you're doing at home with your kids, with your family, with your friends, whatever you're posting on Facebook, on Instagram, here's what I want you to understand. You have become a leader. The moment that you use your words, you are a leader of some type of influence. Did you hear that? You're a leader in some way with whatever words that you say. And here's what we need to understand. Paul looks at this young Timothy and he says, look, life isn't easy. Be careful with your words. In fact, wouldn't most of us say this to a younger person if we were counseling them or giving them wisdom, if we were praying for them? Wouldn't we say that life is not fair? Anybody in the house? Life isn't fair. And I know it sounds like a cliche, but it's true. Life isn't fair, but God is what? Good. God is still good. But here's the question. When we're suffering, when we're struggling, what are our words like? Do our words reflect that love and power of God in our lives? Especially when we're down, when we know that life isn't fair. Has anybody complained lately? Well, life isn't fair. This isn't right. No, life isn't fair. Things aren't right. But God is still good. And here is what Paul says to this young Timothy. He says to him, stay focused. And then, and then he does this beautiful thing. He says, stay focused. And here's the word he gives him, grace. Stay focused on grace. Well, it seems like it's just a, it just seems like a word, right? I mean, kind of like this, it's a beautiful word. It's grace is God's unmerited favor. Does anybody deserve God's love? Mm -mm. Aren't you glad you have it, though? I mean, Paul looks at this young Timothy. He knows he's not going to be around forever, teaching him, mentoring him. So he looks at him, and he says this. He says, grace, stay strong in grace. And if we were to be able to peel back the layers, we would see that how Paul uses the word grace in the Greek language, it really means keep growing. Don't stop. Don't get yourself in a snit. You all right? Don't get yourself in a place where you feel like that things are just never going to turn out right. Do, do any of you ever know people that every time you talk to them, they depress you? 
Come on. Paul, Paul says, wait a minute. Timothy, I'm in chains. I'm already in prison. He says, things aren't fair. Every person in this room has stuff in our lives that isn't fair. Amen? But God is still good. And the way that we keep moving forward and not get stuck in the past, not get stuck with our junk, we've got to jettison the problems, get focused on God, and it takes grace. Keep growing in God's unmerited favor. I had a little bit of surgery back at the end of last year. I had some shoulder surgery. And I had a torn a rotator cuff. It wasn't torn all the way. And so uh, ever since my surgery, I, I, on my left side, I have a weight limit. Okay? At first, for the first uh, couple of weeks, I couldn't even lift a coffee cup. And I thank God I was right-handed. Praise God. Then, then, then a couple weeks later, I, I could lift a pound. Then, I was five weeks in, and I was up to four pounds. Well, right now, I'm about seven weeks in, and I went to the doctor this week. I was first in line. Didn't even have to wait in the doctor's office. Miracles happen. And... And so the doctor heard the nurse and I talking. He comes in and he's laughing. And I said, Dr. Chen, I said, what are you laughing about? He said, because you're frustrated that you can only lift eight pounds right now. I said, I thought I'd be further than this. He goes, you're only seven weeks out. He said, the fun is in the future. Listen. Wherever you're at, come on, hang, hang on this. Wherever you're at, right now in your life, you may feel like it's unfair. You may feel like you're struggling. You may wonder how you got to where you are. Some of where you got to where you are today is, is maybe your circumstances. Some of it is our own decision making. Amen to that. But listen, I'm here to tell you that to talk the talk, you and I have to decide to lean into grace and you start from where you are and lead the revolution. Decide to lead where you are. You're all leading with something. You're all contagious with something. Is it, is it positive words? Are you the person lifting other people up? Are you encouraging people? Or are you the one complaining about things every time you turn around? And I know, I know our society, especially in this political environment right now, everything is negative. I am so tired of it. I don't care what you vote. Haven't you had enough yet? But you know what the counterbalance to that is? Followers of Jesus who talk the talk and lead the revolution. That's what we're about at BWC. We're about leading the revolution. Dr. Martin Luther King, this is one of my, becoming one of my favorite quotes from him because this is so powerful. He wrote, by opening our lives to God in Christ, we become new creatures. This experience which Jesus spoke of as the new birth is essential if we are to what church? Be transformed, non-conformist. Only through an inner spiritual transformation do we gain the strength to fight vigorously the evils of the world in a humble and loving spirit. Amen and amen. Come on, it's a transformation from the inside out that only Jesus can bring about through His grace. That's what we need to lean into to talk the talk. Every person in this room can make a decision when you walk out of here to lead the revolution that pleases God with the power of our words, talk the talk, and begin to make a difference. Don't just conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And when our minds are renewed, the talk that we talk is pleasing to God and it changes people's lives. All right, well, there's another instruction, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. 
Paul goes on to write, and we're going to divide this verse into two parts, but let's read the whole thing. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Here's the second instruction. Let's say it together. Talk the talk and speak the language. Now, when was the last time that you spoke something and it influenced someone because of what you said? I want you to think about that for a minute. Maybe, maybe if you've got kids, it was your children, hopefully. You ever try to tell your kids to do something and they get old enough to not want to do it? In fact, one of my favorites is, is my oldest daughter, Melissa. Kay and I talked the talk. We tried to lead a revolution of just getting her to make her bed, just to clean up her room. We, we tried that. In fact, by the way, parents, this is so cool. My daughter is older now. She's in her 30s. She's a beautiful human being, and her house is always spotless. I don't know how it worked, but somewhere between high school and now, there was a transformation. <laughs> don't give up. Just don't give up, all right? Talk the talk and speak the language. You are in the process of influencing people one way or the other with your talk. That's true in the life of Bridgewater Church as well. We're influencing people with our talk. But it's frustrating when you can't speak the language. I, I did a little internet uh, research. This was fun. Did you know? Do you know how many languages there are? As of 2009 in the world, there are 6,909 distinct languages in the world. Okay? Did you know that the Bible's only been translated into 2,508 languages so far? How about this? In the United States, you would, I thought the number would be higher, but 350 different languages reported about 2009. 350 languages were used in the United States. As of 2019, the six top languages are, that are in the greater Cincinnati area, English, Spanish, who would have picked Somalia? Right, that was on your top of your list if we were doing a checklist, right? Arabic, Chinese, and German, right? Speaking the language, you've, you've gotta be able to speak the language. But then I got to thinking about it, there's all kind of different language styles, aren't there? Like, think about it. How many of you understand what your medications say from the pharmacist? That's its own language. How about doctors? Have you been around any engineers lately? That's its own language. And what about musicians? They're a breed all their own. They speak their own language. And then I've got a question for the guys. How many of you can speak woman? And if I were you, I would not say yes if you're sitting by one. I'm just giving you the heads up. I'm just going to let that actually go. I have several thoughts about it, but I'm letting it go, dear. Okay. Now, we've got to be able to talk the talk. We've got to be able to communicate with each other in a way that helps anybody who's going to come into Bridgewater Church understand what it means to speak the language. And I want you to think about even that from a church perspective. I don't know how many variations I've gone through as a pastor for the words we use for the entrance of our church. When I was a younger pastor, somebody said to me, Pastor, I'll meet you in the vestibule. I said, what's a vestibule? And then the guy looked at me and he said, well, you know, the narthex. I said, what's the narthex? He said, come on, pastor, the foyer, the foyer. He goes, he finally looked at me and he goes, you know, the entrance where the doors are. <laughs> and by the way, we call it what? What do we call it? The lobby. We call it the lobby because what do most people understand? If I asked you to meet me in the vestibule, who knows where you'd end up? But if I say, meet me in the lobby, pretty much we may end up at the entrance doors. And by the way, if you didn't know that, I want you to speak the language, just head toward the doors, okay? 
Now, now let's, make it, let's make it a little deeper. What about when we say to really talk the talk, speak the language? What about when Paul looks at Timothy and he says that you have to be able to take what you've heard from me and entrust it to reliable people to teach? Well, what had he heard from him? Have you ever thought about this? If you were brand new and you came into church and you heard the words, the body and the blood of Jesus, we call that communion. We call that the Lord's Supper. But what if you had never heard about the body and the blood of Jesus? Would you think we're cannibals? Have you ever thought of it? You see, we need to talk the talk in such a way that whoever comes in, that even if they feel like they don't know what they're doing here, listen, and, and isn't that really the, the, the prayer of the church? Is that we fill up with so many people that never have heard of Jesus. They don't know who he is. I want the church to be full of people who don't know Jesus yet, don't you? To be transformed? That's why, that's why for us it's easier, instead of asking people to come to an altar, we've changed and said, come to the prayer room. Because you can see the letters on the doorway. You know someone is there waiting for you. And everybody pretty much understands of all languages that we all need prayer. We need God's help. Well, what if we were to take Paul's words? What if we were to take Paul's words when he says, and the things you've heard from me, and we were to boil those down, if we were to get them down to, to a basic two-word phrase so that everybody was speaking the same language, here at Bridgewater Church that embodies and, and, and it, it speaks to the power of God's word and the transformation that God can bring about in a life. What would it be like? Well, here it is. And I want you to say this together. Ready? Be transformed. If, if somebody were to say to you, what is Bridgewater Church about? What's the talk that we talk? It is to be transformed. We don't want to just believe in Jesus. We want a transformational relationship with Jesus Christ. We want it to get in every aspect of our lives. And, and I, know, I know this about myself. Nobody's perfect. True? Not one For all have sinned and what? Fallen short of God's glory. There isn't one single person in the room that is perfect today. We're all the same. We need God's grace. But you know what? To be transformed, that is the talk that we want to happen here. We want you to get to the point that whenever you see each other, instead of simply talking about your favorite restaurant or the sports game that you saw, what would happen if when we got together in every situation, whether you were one-on-one -on -one or in your life group or, or you just saw somebody in the parking lot, what would happen if we started telling transformational stories? What did God do for you this week? How did God interact in your life? What did God say to you this week? What did you pull out of your devotions this week when you read the word of God? Or what if you spoke to somebody who said, I don't even know how I ended up at this church. Could you begin by telling them the transformational story of Jesus in your life? See, that's what it means to be transformed. Look, look at this next slide with me. This is our mission statement and we, we've expanded where we've been in the last couple of years. So, so let's start at the very top. Let's say it together, ready? Be transformed. Bridgewater Church is called to lead people into a transformational relationship with Jesus Christ by seeking God, sharing the story, serving the world, and sending the people. That If you want to know the essence of God's word, it is that Jesus Christ wants to transform your life. He wants you to seek him, and then once you find him, you've got this beautiful story of transformation to share, then to serve, and then we send people 
Sometimes it's our kids to college. Sometimes we send people on medical missions trips. Sometimes we send them to an international youth convention. Sometimes we send them into ministry full time. But you see, that's what it is. We want to talk the talk. That's exactly what Paul said to Timothy. He said, the things you've heard me say. Well, what was he talking about? Words of transformation. See, I don't know about you, but I just think it's time that we, we change the conversation from all of the, the problems and all the struggles and all the leaders that should have more encouragement to say publicly. I think we, I think all of us can change the language and it starts at home with our kids it starts with families friends transformational talk of Jesus Christ now that's good stuff isn't it amen okay one more thing so here's the last part of the verse 2 Timothy 2.2 2. here's the third instruction and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Entrust to reliable people. This, they're qualified. Well, what makes us qualified? See, I don't think you have to know a lot of things to be qualified to teach somebody else about Jesus Christ. But what you and I do have to have is a personal relationship with him. That's where it starts. And then we begin to entrust to reliable people because there is such power in our words. I, uh, I decided to do some paper shredding a few months ago last summer. And when I went to go shred some papers, uh, I've told this story a couple of times, but I thought it was worthwhile because I was driving into Hamilton, went and shredded and came back. And when I got to the, the bank that was doing the free shred day, he said, hey, pastor, he said, well, he didn't know I was a pastor at the time. And he said, hey, he said, if you want to come back, bring more, I had more stuff to shred. So I got back in my truck and I was going through Hamilton and um, there was somebody uh, sitting at the light at turn green and I gave a little honk you know, because it was green and I was waiting and it wasn't anything obnoxious. It was just a little honk and the guy pulled out. And so I drove to the west side of Hamilton and, and when I did, I got over uh, near Frisch's on the west side. And, and uh, it was a warm day and I had my window down and this guy next to me pulled up and it was the same guy in the car with his kid. And what I didn't realize at the time was that this father was teaching his son how to drive and so that's why he'd been a little late to pull out and my window was down and the dad began to instruct me that you should never honk your horn at anyone and he did that with a lot of words I don't use and he began to cuss me out to which I just pulled on away and just drove on because I thought I'm, I don't need to engage in any road rage, right? And so then I pulled up to the bank where I was sh going to shred and uh, he pulled in behind me. He pulled in behind me. And when I got out of the car to get my stuff to give it to the guys for shredding, he got out of his car. Now he was a little bit shorter man than me and he, he, stood, right, he stood right in front of me. And when he stood right in front of me, he began to tell me what a lousy person I was and how I had been so cruel to his son that was learning to drive. And he continued to use some very vivid language. And then I, I noticed the window was down in his car and his son, who was driving, a teenager, was listening to all this. And he looked at me and he said, you owe my son an apology. And I, I thought, well, I, I thought about laying hands on him without prayer. Then I thought, no, I, I, I probably shouldn't do it. And he, and he yelled at me again. 
He said, you owe my son an apology. And then I, this thought went through my mind. I thought about saying, I apologize that this is your dad. <laughs> but then, have any of you ever heard of grace? Have any of you ever heard of the Holy Spirit? I heard God, God didn't whisper, God was shouting. Don't do anything stupid. <laughs> and then I heard God say this, lean over and apologize to the young man. It's the only thing he is going to see of me today. Nothing humanly in me wanted me to do it, but I leaned over and I said, son, I'm sorry for honking at you. His dad followed me to the truck saying, I hope you die when you leave. I'm going to call the police. I hope someone hits you and kills you on the way home. Yeah. I want to be clear about something in this last word of instruction. The story that you're going to share with other people oftentimes will not be in the words you say. It'll be in the life you live. Anybody in the house? See, we all have choices to make. Every one of us sitting in the room today, we all have choices to make. We have to be the ones to decide how we're going to pass on this information to people so that there is reliable words that will help people find Jesus. That dad that day needed Jesus, and the only father that that boy was observing was his. Until... In some way, perhaps, God would use that moment later in life. None of us know what our influence will be and how you will empower people with your talk. Whether it's verbal or whether it's your nonverbal body language. But I don't want anyone to be confused about sharing the story. The story that God wants all of us to share is the story of Jesus Christ. You might be in the room today and you've never asked Jesus to be your savior. Not one person can save themselves. We need God to save us. And it happens in a moment when you ask Jesus to be your savior. That's the transforming story we're talking about. And at Bridgewater Church, we believe that. It doesn't matter how old you are, we believe in transformation for every generation. Whether you're, whether you're in your 70s, 80s, or 90s, or whether you're in your teens or 20s or 30s, we believe in transformation for every generation. But I want to be true to the biblical passage we're in today. Paul, an elder Paul, was writing to a younger Timothy. And he was at the end of his life. He was, he was running the last race of his life. And he writes to a young Timothy. And look at what he says as he prepares to see Jesus face to face. I want you to see this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He writes, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Now, look at what he says in his instructions. He's talking to Timothy. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved the world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Every person Paul is asking for is younger than him. He's poured into them. We, we are about transformation for every generation. You don't need to walk up to me and say, Pastor, you love younger people more than you love older people. Don't even do it. We'll end up in my office for four hours. It'll all be prayer. Don't do it. I, I'm for transformation for every generation, but I will tell you this. It is the responsibility of every person in the room 
to be about transformation for a new generation coming behind us. If you're a 20-year-old, you have teenagers. If you're teenagers, there's younger children you can help with in Pastor Liz's ministry. If, if you're 80, if you're 80, then I'm a young man to you. Forget the gray hair, right? But if you're 60, there's somebody in their 40s. And if there's somebody who's 40, there's somebody in their 30s. And if you're 30, there's somebody in their 20s. We must talk the talk that we believe in. And we have got to be about saving every generation with the power and the love of Jesus Christ. That's what this is about. It isn't about how many people come, but we want, a, we want people to come of every walk of life, every generation, every culture, every color. We want to be a safe place to talk the talk about Jesus because somebody helped me find him. It's about our calling and our culture. It's about our talk. And we've got to share the story because if Jesus has touched your life, you've got a story to share. And it's a great story. I guarantee it. This morning, we've got some great people that are going to share an amazing story. In just a minute, we're going to pray. And we're going to watch about a dozen people get baptized. Now, let me just explain that. These amazing people have been transformed by Jesus Christ. And they're different ages, but most of them are young. They're all younger than I am. Praise God. And they're going to they're gonna follow the example of Jesus. Baptism in water cannot save you. Only Jesus can save you. But baptism is an outward celebration of an inward transformation that has happened through Jesus. And when I pray, the band will get ready, they'll come up, our wonderful pastors are coming with them. I have the, I have the awesome privilege of getting changed and, and baptizing a very, very dear young adult. And I want you to know this morning that this is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. Change lives. And so they'll come up and they'll share a little bit their name and their story. Then they'll go out and we're going to baptize. You'll see it on the screens. And when they come up out of the water, I want you, the first thing that they hear, I want it to be amen. Let's give it a try. Ready? One, two, three. Amen. Because that's what this is. Because someday... If you know him, if you know Jesus and you've been transformed, you'll see him face to face. And he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. I want you to just sit for right now. But I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask God's blessing as our teams get ready because I can't think of a better illustration of what it means to talk the talk and share the story than what we're about to see and hear and experience. Let's pray. Father, God, we thank you today for your love and your grace. We thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. It is a day to talk the talk. It is a day to put our faith and our trust in you. This is what this is about. And Father God, we have people getting ready right now that are preparing for this incredible moment. And Lord Jesus, we're asking that you work now in this place, that Father, you begin to change lives in this, this sanctuary, this auditorium. And God, we pray right now that every heart would be open 
Because the best stories we're about to hear are the stories of these young people to be transformed for a new generation. God, every generation matters, but we must continue to tell the story. So Father, may we prepare and prepare the hearts of these lovely, lovely people. In Jesus' name, amen.